Bathroom facilities in the untamed frontier of the Wild West were notably different from today's modern comforts. These facilities didn't feature proper baths, and most weren't formal rooms. Instead, pioneers, homesteaders, cowboys, and their counterparts had recourse to outhouses, pots, and whatever nature provided. In matters of relieving themselves, men and women in the American West might have ducked behind a tree. As time advanced, early settlers and others built signature Old West outhouses for that same purpose. However, the majority of these structures bore rather undesirable traits. Overall, using a cowboy bathroom was an adventure all its own, one replete with singular sights and scents. Remember to hit the like button because it helps us a lot. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and press the notification bell to not miss the upcoming interesting videos. Corn cobs and newspaper could do the job. As a relatively modern luxury, toilet paper wasn't available in the Wild West. Instead, individuals relied on resourceful substitutes, such as whatever materials were at hand, be it grass, an aged corn cob, or shreds of newspaper. Corn held a significant role within the diet, economy, and culture in the American West. A vivid account from Belle Madison, who grew up in mid-19th century Nebraska, recounts the multifaceted use of corn cobs and husks as not only makeshift toilet paper, but also as firewood and even toys. The method of employing corn cobs for cleansing proved surprisingly effective. Left hanging outside the outhouse, users grabbed them on their way in. After the task was accomplished, people would perform multiple wipes, maneuvering the cob across sensitive areas from various angles. With the advent of actual toilet paper, a choice became available, yet many denizens of the West persisted in favoring corn cobs over the novel paper options. Alternatively, another option, regardless of what was available, was to use nothing at all. Outhouses were simply four walls. Known as outhouses or privies, these facilities were strategically positioned away from the main dwelling. Often they consisted of a basic excavation, roughly five to six feet deep, encompassed by four walls and ideally a roof. Usually three to four square feet in size, outhouses had no heat or light and proper airflow. When the hole in an outhouse filled up or the odor grew unbearable, it was concealed, prompting the relocation of the outhouse to a fresh site. The same rudimentary walls would be erected anew sheltering a newly excavated pit. Outhouses were disinfected with lime or lye. To counteract the pervasive smells emanating from outhouses, lye or lime emerged as common solutions. One or the other could be thrown down a hole after use. Lime in particular held a reputation as a potent disinfectant and was generously mixed with urine or excretia in liberal quantity. Widely accessible and cost-effective, lime was also employed to scrub the interiors of outhouses, elevating their hygiene and aesthetic appeal. Lye, boasting similar disinfecting properties, was equally effective in breaking down waste material, aiding in the maintenance of cleanliness within these facilities. Outhouse toilets built mostly of wood. Constructed primarily from wood, although metal roofs were sometimes incorporated, Outhouses could be somewhat dangerous. The seating arrangement consisted essentially of boxes featuring oval openings. Seats were hopefully smooth, but there was no guarantee. Seats, doors, and walls all harbored the potential for splinters, particularly following prolonged use and exposure to the elements. Even items like corn cobs, newspapers, and early forms of toilet paper were not exempt from the risk of splinters prompting Northern Tissue to market their product as splinter-free as late as 1935. Flies and nasty smells abounded. As waste piled up, the stench within an outhouse grew more pronounced, inevitably drawing the attention of flies and assorted insects. Neither lye nor lime possessed the power to entirely stave off both the odors and pestering creatures, particularly in the sweltering heat of summer. During these warmer months, visits to the outhouse were decidedly brief, 
driven by an immediate need to conclude affairs and exit swiftly. Flies attracted to outhouses also made their way to living spaces with a few window screens to keep them out. They flocked to foodstuffs and other wares. However, flies weren't the sole concern for those who frequented outhouses. The threat of spider bites loomed as these arachnids could target exposed skin, while mosquitoes took advantage of the moment when individuals were engaged in their tasks. Chamber pots were invaluable during winter. Visiting the outhouse during the winter wasn't without its challenges. In the chilly months, waste tended to congeal and accumulate more swiftly, often rising to the brim of the pit. Venturing outdoors in the cold held little allure either. To circumvent this, pioneers in the American West turned to chamber pots as a solution. Dubbed thunder mugs, chamber pots were kept near or under one's bed. If utilized during the night, their contents were later emptied into the privy, a nearby water source, or simply out the window in the morning. Train bathrooms were very simple. As pioneers embarked on their journey to the western frontier, trains often served as their chosen mode of transportation. In the initial stages, passengers relied on facilities at stops along their route. However, with the gradual elongation of trips, trains had to address basic human necessities. In the midst of the 19th century, select trains began to incorporate compact restrooms for travelers, although even amenities offered to first-class passengers were rudimentary by today's standard. These train lavatories were partitioned into two chambers, a toilet area and a closet. For men, the closet, what modern observers would call a toilet, often included a wooden box with a cutout at the top. Waste would be deposited through a drop chute, descending directly onto the tracks. Both men and women could access washing facilities within these restrooms, though women had nicer closets that were potentially equipped with commodes. For immigrants aboard the train, accommodations differed. Instead of enclosed spaces, they were provided with a wooden panel in the floor, capable of being opened to expose the tracks below. The bathroom was just the woods. Employing an outhouse or a chamber pot wasn't invariably obligatory or expedient, particularly when at the outdoors, such as a forest or a watercourse, could serve the purpose. In rural landscapes, there was no real risk in venturing out to the trees when nature called. Nevertheless, depositing human waste in a river or a comparable water body held the potential to introduce pollutants downstream, impacting nearby residents. This peril also arose if an outhouse was situated in close proximity to a water source. Outhouses had multiple holes. Outhouses were used by men, women, and children of all ages. Instead of constructing separate privies, certain outhouses incorporated an assortment of holes, each with tailored openings to accommodate people of differing sizes. However, it's important to note that a multi-hold outhouse wasn't designed for simultaneous use by multiple occupants. Outhouses featuring three holes included sizable apertures for men, smaller seating areas for women, and even more diminutive openings for children. Meanwhile, two-hole outhouses offered a larger seat for adults alongside a smaller perch tailored for children. There were several two-story outhouses. The outhouse built by Samuel Gamel in Gaze, Illinois in 1869 featured two stories and was perhaps the first structure of its kind. During the same period, two additional two-story outhouses emerged, one in Phelps, New York in 1869 and another in Belle Plaine, Minnesota in 1871. Moses Barlow was the creator of the New York structure, employing brick in its construction while the others opted for wood. Notably, several other multi-story outhouses appeared across the United States, potentially arising during the late 19th century. Irrespective of their numbers, double-decker outhouses like the one in Gaze were characterized by seats on both levels. Waste from the top fell into a pit on the ground level behind a false wall. This innovative approach prevented any unwelcome surprises from landing on users in the facilities below. Outhouses were still popular in the 1930s. 
As part of the Works Progress Administration, or WPA, the New Deal program that put millions of Americans to work during the late 1930s and early 1940s was to build outhouses. The WPA undertook the construction of approximately 2.3 million outhouses across the United States. These government-built outhouses adhered to a blueprint calling for structures of about 3.5 square feet, situated atop holes measuring 4.5 feet in depth. Characterized by metal roofing, these outhouses were situated on either concrete or wooden platforms, complete with screened ventilation systems. The design ideally positioned these facilities at a distance from water sources while prioritizing the use of durable materials. It's worth noting that certain instances deviated from the original concept, yielding larger outhouses. In numerous cases, these structures boasted dual compartments and even provisions for storing lime buckets. Please like and share if you find the video content interesting and useful. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and comment below so as not to miss the upcoming interesting videos. Thanks for watching.